What's up outlaws? How is everybody today? Hey, listen, you just finally got that good news in, right? Springtime, summertime, early summertime. You're going elk hunting this year. Freaking awesome. More than likely, if you drew out elk hunting this year, you drew out in the West. And so, you know, maybe you're like, dude, I don't know what caliber I need. I don't know what rifle I need. I don't know if I need to get in shape for this elk hunt. What do I do? Well, if you wanna know what to do, first stop and push that subscribe button and watch this video to the very end. All right, guys, elk hunting in the West, specifically, actually Oklahoma now, but Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, I have been a part of at least two elk hunts a year for the last 35 years. It was like the ultimate hunt to be able to draw out on. You know, growing up in New Mexico, my dad and my grandfather, they always wanted to do elk. So we started out with bows because, you know, bows seemed to be the easiest way to get to hunt them. And we found out that whenever you're hunting in New Mexico, like those bow shots tend to be 80 to 100 yards. Well, when I was a kid, that wasn't even possible. Like. You know, today you can do it. Today I've got a, you know, the Bowtech, what is it, the SS34, the Matthews, I don't know what the new ones are. I'm not, a, I, I have some bows, I'm not the big bow guy, but 100 yards is like a normal shot. I, I remember being with one of the TV stars, I won't say who it is, so it's not a big taboo thing, but I watched him take an 80 pound bow and shoot five arrows at 135 yards this big into a fence post. Some of you will say it's taboo, but it's really not. Like. 100 yard bow shots is a thing now, but it wasn't when I was growing up. So then we switched into the muzzle loaders and you know, it started with percussion cap and I can't tell you how many elk my dad and my grandfather missed. And then it became, you know, inline muzzle loaders. We started killing elk. And then when you draw it with a rifle, we kill a lot of elk. New Mexico is really hard. Typically it's muzzle loader or bow, but you can grab them in Colorado every year though. In Texas, Oklahoma, I shoot with a rifle. Um, yeah, there's elk in Oklahoma. It's pretty cool, huh? So what do I use whenever I shoot elk with a rifle? Okay, this is not for cow elk, but it will, it will apply to cow elk um, because we get cow elk permits every year. I don't get bull permits. I get them for my kids every year. I get them for friends every year. We go on these hunts and I have just seen 50, 60 animals harvested with a rifle at elk animals harvested with a rifle. Okay. Am I the greatest ever? No. Is my experience the only? No. Is there a lot of answers? Yes, there's a lot, but you came here to get my opinion. So here it is. I would choose a Magnum. Now, remember, I want you to go to the link right here and watch how to choose best hunting caliber. Here, I break down all of the different things that you need to know about calibers and the truth about them. But for now, let's stick with what I think is the best for elk hunting. So what I think is the best for elk hunting right now is a Magnum caliber. Will a 6.5 Creedmoor work? Yes, to about five, 600 meters. Will a 260 work? Yes, five, 600 meters. Will a 6.5 PRC work? Yes, it will work. None of those are my first choice for elk hunting, right? Um, my first choice for an elk hunting ca cartridge is a big Magnum. And the reason why is there are lots of different opportunities whenever you're hunting elk to take shots. I would say most of them in the West, the longest shot you may have to take should be about 600, but you should get a lot of three to 500 yard shots in there. You know, my, I think my furthest is 1,604 meters, but um, I've shot a lot of them at seven, eight, and 900 meters, but I, I did that on purpose, right? I could have got closer to them, I could have. Um, but it seems to me like most of the time when I'm hunting in the West, especially elk, and I'm glassing and I find the elk and I'm like, dude, those are 600 yards. Most people who aren't long range shooters say, that's a thousand, there's no way I can hit that. So that's why whenever I'm elk hunting, I'm always, or deer hunting, doesn't matter. The mountains are very hard to, they'll, they'll disorient you and you won't know exactly how far something is. So throughout the day, I'm constantly taking my binoculars and saying, okay, how far do I think that is? I think it's 400. Oh shoot, it was, you know, 620. Or I think it's a thousand click it, oh, it was only 700, right? It's so deceiving, but that's what I do when I'm out there. I'm constantly using my binoculars, my range finding binoculars, and I'm hitting different areas thinking how far they're gonna be. And then whenever I come to an area, like over a water hole, because we know elk are going to water every night, there's your first tip on, hey, you, you're hunting elk, go to water. Like in the middle of the day, go to water, drive around the water hole. If they're not 
If there ain't a bunch of fresh tracks there, they're not there. Go to the next water hole. They go to water every single day at dark, every single day. So be there. Whenever I set up right there, I, I arrange all of my areas so I know, hey, if, if they come out of this part of the, the, the meadow, um, they're 320. If they come out in front of me, they're 420. If they come out over here, they're 780. Um, the furthest shot that I'm willing to take is over here. And then that allows you to start looking at your dope on your rifle and saying, okay, this is where, you know, I, these are where they're going to be. And you kind of memorize them. That, that's how I do it. Some of the shots that I've seen on elk are you may have to shoot them through the paunch right here. So you shoot them through their belly. Like you think that you're making a perfect heart shot, but they're turned just a little bit. And you've got to go through all of that belly. It was described to me whenever I was a kid as the paunch and you got to go through there. So it takes a big magnum to get all the way through that. You know, a 6.5 Creedmoor, I've seen them hold up. Like if you don't have a perfect heart shot or a lung shot on them with the smaller calibers, then the, the bullet will get lodged in and don't, it doesn't make it all the way to the heart. What I want you to pay attention to is like, whenever you're out there shooting them, make sure that you're understanding that you, it may look like it's a perfect broadside shot, but he's turned sideways or turned sideways. And now you're shooting through a bunch of other stuff to be able to actually harvest this animal, right? So big magnums do really well for that. Big magnums also, one of the reasons I'm a big fan of them is they, when you hit them in a bad spot and you're using like a really good hunting bullet, like a Nosler partition or a Barnes TSX, T, a Barnes, or you're using a uh, Hornady ELDX, which is my preferred hunting bullet, um, and it opens up and it does a lot of damage on them. If you make a bad wind call on a shot, you're gonna break it down, right? If you have a, a kid that is hunting with you and they make a bad shot and they jerk it just a little bit and it hits them somewhere, it's gonna break them down. So this is one of the things that I think is also being a responsible hunter. So some of you will say, hey, it's not ethical not to have a perfect broadside shot and shoot them right through the heart. I mean, those are your ethics, cool. If it's turned this way, you may say that that's not ethical, but you still may shoot at that shot. I, to me, it's an ethical shot and maybe not to you, I don't care. Let's, this is not on ethics, but let's say you have a kid or let's say you pull or you flinch and you hit the elk anywhere else what you want that bullet to do is break that elk down, right? You don't wanna be like, dude, I, I needed this perfect shot like this, but I screwed up. Like I have to take in human error, right? My rifle is gonna be scientifically perfect. So before I go on this hunt, I'm gonna have a great optic. I'm not gonna buy cheap junk. The optic is gonna be zeroed. I'm gonna have a really good set of scope mounts. I'm gonna lock tight those scope mounts. I'm gonna use a torque wrench and actually set those perfectly. I'm gonna get a level and level it perfectly. I'm going to go through my entire rifle, make sure it's clean, make sure I have the best load, and I'm gonna know my dope before I go out there to six, 800 meters or yards, however you guys do it. And I'm gonna understand everything about that rifle. It is gonna be scientifically correct. So if there's a mistake, it's me, right? It's the jerk behind the trigger. So it's gonna be my bad wind call, or it's gonna be my jerk. And you also have to remember guys, like in, in the field, everything is not a perfect condition. So I may have to be shooting off of a tripod in a 20 mile an hour wind. I can still be very effective with this when I shoot off this tripod in this 20 mile an hour wind. But if I'm trying to hit my watch, I just may hit around my watch. Was that unethical? No, it's not unethical. You're still gonna do, you're still gonna make a lethal shot on them but that may be your conditions. Your condition may be you're hanging off the side of a tree branch or taking a knee. The, the conditions just vary so much when you're out hunting in the field. It's very rarely a uh, perfect bipod, have a back rest, everything's perfect shot, right? Very rarely is it that. And th another reason is, hey, you may, I can't tell you how many times I've been hunting where we're walking and all of a sudden up comes this elk that you weren't expecting or a deer specifically this video an elk and you're like holy cow that's him and you throw your gun up and boom you shoot him right hey if you pull that shot just a little bit because you got excited maybe you had buck fever any of that stuff all of those reasonings you want to be able to break that animal down and be able to come up with another follow-up shot very fast so that's the next thing is you want to make sure that your gun is set up 
Do you need a, a semi-auto like a, you know, Nemo 300 Norma Mag? No, um, or 300 Wind Mag? No, you don't need a gas gun. But you do need to be able to say, boom, follow up shot. And so that's another, that's a tip for elk hunting. So tip number two for elk hunting is make sure that when you fire, if you have somebody with you, they're watching and you're putting another bullet in there. And if the elk hasn't fallen, shoot him again. Don't be the guy that's like, oh, I think I hit him good enough that he's gonna fall and let him walk around because I've seen him walk and walk and walk and then take off and you never see him again. Like, it was a great shot, you actually killed him, but you actually never find him. You can look for days and not find him. I'll give you a really good example. I was with Bobby Hart hunting the in July, an elk hunt. It was a depredation hunt in Colorado where we got to shoot elk in the velvet. I got a video of it. Uh, I killed this elk at 888. I shot him right through the heart at 888. The guide was like, you're never gonna hit him. Bob was like, just do it. So I did, I had a th uh, 30 heart up there. Whom, put a bullet right through him. He starts moving, I'm like, hey, I killed him. And the guide was like, no, you didn't. You just hit him bad. And I was like, no. And then, so he's like, do it again. So I shot another bullet in there. I shot both those bullets as far apart. And he ran maybe 80 yards, fell over and died. No telling how much he would have kept running had I didn't shoot him again, right? Now we would have found him because it was all flat land, but they just can take a lot of shots, especially the further you get out. They can just take a lot, man. They can, they're just big animals and they're tough. They can just take a lot and just keep soaking it up and soaking it up. And you don't, you want to make sure that you have something that opens up on them and really breaks them down. Okay. Uh, will a 6.5 Creedmoor do it? Yeah. I would say don't do it past 500 meters, right? I'd really say three to 500 is where you want to be. but. I would not want this one time that you spend a lot of money to go on this elk hunt. Maybe this is the first time you've ever drawn. Maybe you'll never draw again. I would not want to test that on a, a, a caliber that wasn't big enough to be able to actually harvest this animal. To the tune, I don't even, I don't even, yes, a 6.5 PRC is enough, but it's not enough for what I recommend. All right, so now here you go. You stayed all this time. What do I recommend? First off, if you're not a reloader, which I'm assuming most of you aren't, then I don't recommend some wild off-ball caliber, okay? I don't, I don't think you need a 338. You don't need a 338 normal or a 338 Lapua or a 338 Edge. I know some of the die-harders really believe in those. All of those are excellent calibers. They'll all do it, but you don't need it because you also have to take into consideration is when you choose that Magnum, you're gonna get major recoil back from that Magnum. Last tip I'm gonna give you on this one before we go into that. What I do with my kids, I have six or seven little kids that hunt with me that are related to me or friends of mine. They'll practice with a 22 long rifle, a 223, my 22 Dasher, and a 6.5 Creedmoor all year. And then I'll set the Magnum in their hand when it comes time to hunt. I never scare them of the recoil. I never tell them it's going to recoil. I don't let them shoot it all year long. They don't need to be used to it. They just need to be used to shooting. Trust me on this. I can tell you 100% this is a fact. They do not need to be tuned up on that rifle. And as a matter of fact, neither do you. So let's say you choose a 300 Norma and you're like, dude, this thing just beats my shoulder to death. Cool, side it in, dope it out, don't touch it again. Practice all year with your, your short action, right? 308, 65 Creedmoor, practice with that. Tune up on that. Then go hunt and you'll just, you'll see that you'll just touch it off and you won't even think about the recoil. You won't remember the recoil, the recoil won't be there. Only thing you wanna watch out for is when you're shooting at an angle, make sure that you don't get scoped, right? I always make sure that when it comes to my kids shooting is that yes, I'll let them shoot a big Magnum, only at the animal when their adrenaline's so pumped up that they're focusing on the animal and I let them shoot. So what do I recommend? I recommend something that you can get an excellent bullet for off the shelf, okay? Seven PRCs probably as low as I would go right now. Uh, at the time of filming this, seven PRC is a newish caliber and it's not prevalent, but in the coming years it will be. 300 PRC is now prevalent, it's everywhere. I've killed a lot of elk in the last three years, I think three, four years with the 300 PRC. I got one when it came out almost immediately and I have just been hammering elk with that 300 PRC. It is a beautiful gun. That 212 ELDX is just a hammer. The standard deviations are always either the single digits or right around 10 or 12, which is the, you can't shoot better than a 12. So you can't hold the gun better than a standard deviation of a 12. So for hunting ranges, six, 800 yards, meters, 
to a thousand, dude, that Hornady ammo right now is just a hammer. Now, again, I've told you on a lot of videos, if you go back and watch them, five years ago, I was not a Hornady fanboy. I said they didn't scream quality. Man, they have really stepped up their game and they've become premium, lower cost ammo. I'm a big fanboy of Hornady ammo now, especially that ELDX. I have not seen an ELDX fail and um, I, I don't even know how many hundreds of animals that my group of personal friends have shot with those, okay? And I literally mean hundreds. Another option, another great option to be able to use is the 28 Nosler. Um, 28 Nosler is still one of the guns that I'm saying is probably the best all around hunting rifle that you can shoot and shoot the lighter bullet. Don't try to go up to the 195, shoot that 175 because it's still gonna kill everything you wanna kill. If you're still the old Kentucky windage hunter, right? And you're, you're not the, hey, I can dial this and hit exactly where I want. You can still do the to 500 yards laid on his back, right? That's a, it, it's a seven STW is what the 28 Nosler is. And that gun was designed for put it right on him to 400 at 500, lay the crosshairs right on his back, shoot, you're gonna hit him. At 600, lay it halfway up his neck and at 700, put it on top of his head and you're gonna hit him. Like that's how long range started. That's still how a lot of people do long range now and are unbelievably effective with it. So the 28 Nosler gives you the flattest, longest shooting of any caliber that I know of right now, or a 7STW, a 7x300. All of those are really great choices for that. And they have good factory ammunition that you can buy. You can call Nosler, get that ammo. You can call Custom Reloads of Dallas. You can call Copper Creek. You can get really good loads for those and you can really hammer some animals with them. So I like the 28 Nosler a lot. I like the 300 PRC a lot. I like the seven millimeter Remington mag a lot. Back in the day when I was a kid, I would tell people like my thought on this was before muzzle brakes got big and technology got better. Seven millimeter mag was like the last thing that you could handle the recoil on. Once you jump to 300, 300 Weatherby, the, the, the recoil started really hurting. I like those two gun, those two calibers for this now because doesn't matter where you go, you should be able to go in there into an elk hunting community and buy that ammo off the shelf and it's gonna be really great ammo for you. So 300 PRC, 28 Nosler, both excellent choices for you right now. Both of them are gonna have availability of ammo everywhere. Your guides are gonna have hunted with that caliber a lot. They're gonna be able to help you on wind calls and um, elevation. So it, those are two great choices for you when it comes to elk. All right, guys, again, one more time, go look at the linked video below on calibers so you can really understand calibers. I think that's probably one of the best videos I've ever done to help you understand them. I just didn't get a lot of people watching it, which is strange. Maybe I need a better thumbnail. I don't know. All right, guys. Hey, like, subscribe, hit the bell notifications. Outlaw out.